Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sportages videocast. Today, we have Paul Price on the show. He's a flow and performance coach, the founder of Inspired Peak Performance, also a podcast host of the Inspired Peak Performance Flowcast. A lot of you may know Paul from his previous life as a professional squash player. Uh, you know, he had a career high ranking of world number four. And later, he was also the head coach of Squash Australia. Paul, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. So, mate, I just wanted to start off talking a little bit about, you know, where you are at the moment. And you've gone from playing and coaching squash to hosting your own podcast and essentially starting your flow and performance business. How, how did this happen? Uh, it's a really, really good question. Um, just over a year ago, I, um, I finished up my role um, as national squash coach with Squash Australia and it was really kind of um, searching for something. I had no idea what I was going to move into. I didn't really have any plans uh, per se, but um, I, I sort of took some time off. I sort of re tried to reconnect with myself and and sort of get back to finding out what kind of lights me up in a way. And the, and the way I came across that, those words, what lights me up, was um, I randomly came across a, a quote um, by, a game, uh, by a guy named Howard Thurman. And it goes along the lines of, um, don't ask what the world needs, ask what, what lights you up type thing and go do that thing. And it kind of really resonated with me and it connected me back to how I've kind of made decisions and operated or followed my passion, I guess, in a way for most of my life, you know, through wanting to be a professional squash player, then to going into music and writing songs and recording music and following that passion. And then discovering out a passion for coaching also, and then wanting to sort of pursue that pathway. Um, and so I was at the point where I was looking for a different challenge and was really determined to find something that, that lit me up internally, like I was intrinsically motivating. And, and that quote just really connected with me and, and that sort of sent me on this path of um, figuring out what stuff really interests me, like what, was, what other stuff was I passionate about? And it's very easy as an athlete to, and a coach, you know, sport that you've been in all your life to, sort of have tunnel vision a little bit and not know about too many things outside of that. But mindset was always a very big part of my career and development as a player and um, in everything I've done for the good and the bad. Um, mindset's been responsible for a lot of my successes and mindset's also been a lot of, uh, responsible for a lot of my failures um, and shortcomings. So I really digged into that a little bit more. I did think about opening a gym again um, up on the Gold Coast. Um, I did my Cert 3 and 4 in fitness, but I just decided to keep moving and just keep looking at different things. And then I was sort of, I stumbled across um, life coaching, things like that. And I looked into it, I did a couple of courses, but it, it still didn't feel like it was the right thing at, at one point until I discovered um, the work of Stephen Kotler um, and flow science. And once I started to look into this flow science and uh, the world, it hit me like a ton of bricks that the, the decisions and the way I lived my life were all based around this, this science. And so I basically started studying with Stephen's organization, the Flow Research Collective. Um, and it just really connected a lot of dots for me and spoke to me on a level that not many other things have in my life and it really did fuel me inside to go like man like if people could harness this knowledge and connect it you know it could really empower people to live um, a more lit up life and improve their well-being and performance and and i guess i was passionate about that part of things well-being and performance because 
of my experience that I had previously um, in the organization that didn't write those things up um, for, for a few reasons. But um, so, yeah, so then I just sort of I've just been involved in this and coaching people and um, helping them focus with their mindset, um, visualization, egos, and lots of, um, and flow science. And I, I realized I love talking about this stuff and I love talking about mindset and development and culture and leadership and all this sort of stuff. So I thought, well, why not interview other people? And these podcasts seem like a great idea and I, I listen to a lot of them. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a flowcast. And it's based around flow, the science of flow, but understanding everybody else's experience with it and what it means to them and unpacking it. And then sort of linking it a little bit to the, the science behind it somewhat to give it a bit more of a, um, of a backing of, of, in a contextual sort of way. So, so yeah, I'm really, um, I'm loving doing the flowcast. I'm loving coaching people um, come from different walks of life on performance and mindset and what's required to, to succeed and how to um, put the protocols in place to make sure that you can do it without burning out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, you know, then the question that then remains to be answered is what is uh, inspired peak performance and what do you do? You've obviously touched on the podcast. You've talked a little bit about uh, mindset, life coaching, uh, you know, there, there are a few of those words around, but what is it? What do you do? Uh, what do you have going on? So, so inspired peak performance basically to me means, um, finding that thing that inspires you the most, um, figuring out what the peak moments for you are in within that environment and then executing the performance behind it with the standards and belief and the, the right protocols to, to go and achieve and live that life. Um, so it's really a, a, about living your best daily life and, and chasing the things that you're really excited about. Um, and so through that, that model, um, when I work with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, we kind of, we identify what's, what really, they truly, truly, want and, and how to link it intrinsically so it's not motivated extrinsically by you know i want to buy a new car or i want to buy a house or you know the things that are materialistic it's really it's, it's driven behind the purpose and passion of who they are and connecting to that um and then once we've found that piece we put together the, the protocols around that but also layering underneath it the the importance of well-being, um, recovery, and what we call the flow cycle, and understanding that. So, and then once we've sort of got the right bedrock or a foundational mindset to sort of for and systems in place, well, then we can start attacking the performance side of things. You know, how do we improve performance? And this goes for athletes, executives, CEOs, leaders in high-stress environments, and coaches, high-performance coaches. Um, that immerse themselves in an environment, you know, there's, there's a lot to uh, unpack there and, and, and rebuild. Um, because what I've noticed throughout my career as an athlete, drawing my own experiences and as a coach, is that, you know, you find there's the people are very, very driven in those industries. Um, and they create very high flow lifestyles that is very taxing mentally and emotionally and physically. And what we tend to do as high performers is we don't tend to recover very well from that um, mm -hmm. because we get addicted to that, chasing that peak moment, that next peak experience, um, which is why I think athletes in general, we, we struggle to transition from one thing to another, especially when sport ends because the day-to-day the -day life without it seems a little mundane. So helping people really connect to what they're passionate about and what their purpose is and and giving them a really definitive north star to, to start to move towards um, is, is quite quite an, empower, an empowering thing to, to, to be able to do and help people with. Um, but then, of course, it's the performance side that, that actually gets you there. So, yeah, yeah so it sort of inspired peak performance and enca encapsulates the whole journey in a way. So, and um, I'm currently 
finishing up my study with the Flow Research Collective to become a, um, an accredited flow coach with, with those guys and learning the frameworks and, and all that sort of stuff and putting that into place with everything that I've already learned and, and, and utilized. So it's really, I really find it fascinating and interesting and it's amazing how much just nudging the bar a little bit can, can change an outcome and that, and that really excites me. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, there, you, you, you broke down so many different things there and you also particularly touched on how these, the, the mindset and even the, the flow is ex exists between doesn't matter whether you're an athlete, whether you're a sport, a business professional, a leader there, it's always transferable. And it's about, you know, like you said, finding that North star, working towards it, building towards it and doing it in the best possible manner for yourself in terms of your well-being, and also getting to what you want to get to away from necessarily those more materialistic targets or aims. Um, you, of course, you know, come from that uh, very significant squash background, having been on both sides, uh, player, coach playing at the top level, coaching at the top level. So I would assume, but I would like to understand and sort of hear from you uh, how your time within squash enabled you to sort of transition into one, doing what you're doing, but I'm sure behind the scenes of, you know, you studying and getting your accreditation and working with your clients now have to do uh the admin side of things have to manage uh a lot of the things from the you know in in running your business that uh you know like i can speak for myself when we started off at sportages we didn't know what we were getting into mate in all honesty so yeah. there's a lot of that that comes up but how do you think um you know your experience is in in squash have enabled you to sort of reach this point and be able to do what you're doing uh the way that you're doing it. Look, I, I think that, you know, we're very fortunate as athletes to go through a, um, a learning platform that allows us to draw from a lot of experience um, in terms of, so you know, if you think about running a business, the moment you become a professional athlete um, in, in small sports, say like squash, um, where we don't have, generally tend to have managers and a team of people taking care of our, all of our affairs, we we have to run a business like you know so you got to book your own flights you got to book your own hotels and um you know and I, I was very fortunate to come through at a time where we were very well supported by the australian institute of sport um, and for myself the victorian institute of sport but we still were taught and were made responsible for our own um, livelihood and, and 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 executing it you know so I think just having that knowledge and learning of going, well, these are the things that are required to be done mm -hmm. to run this squash player business. Um, and you kind of, you kind of go through that. Um, so in essence, I've always been running a business and I, and, and it wasn't probably until I was, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago that, that, that I actually realized that. And someone I think pointed that out to me going, we've well, already, you've, you have tons of business experience just not in the traditional sense. You've run a business all your life. Um, and I think we as athletes, um, we forget that. We, do, we don't make that link to go, man, like look at all the business experience that I actually do have and how to connect that with where we may possibly go in the future and how to draw on that experience. But I think we're athletes, we're very fortunate that we are able to, we're very used to setting goals, executing game plans, um, being kind of uh, really disciplined with doing some of the hard stuff. Um, so I think it's, it's important that we draw on that success um, and lifestyle um, and the way we lived as athletes to go, well, really the, the, the recipe for success is the same no matter what industry you're in. It's just linking and contextualizing it to what that new thing is. So for me now, I still 
I need to set clear goals. I need to set big, high, hard goals. And, and what I do with, with clients like setting sort of massive transformative purposes these days, which is a big, that big North Star and work backwards from that. So, you know, having that almost like a training plan. So, you know, today, what I had to do today was put together an episode of my flowcast that I recorded with, uh, funny enough, um, Mike Way, the head coach of the Harvard squash team. Um, and so there's a clear goal list for that. And there's a, there's a purpose for that, that episode, there's a purpose behind it. So you can really draw on that success as an athlete, the resiliency, knowing that there's ups and downs, you know, um, knowing that surround yourself with good people that are supportive of your vision and your, your, um, your goals and dreams is really important. That's the same, like, you know, having a great coaching team around you. And, you know, I think it, I, you know, doesn't matter what field you're in, you probably should have a coach of some sort, um, be it a performance coach, a, a business coach, um, a life coach, um, you know, if you're really looking to go that next level and kind of transcend a little bit, you, you really, you can't, the journey is tough alone. So I think as athletes, we understand that as well. And going, you know, and we're used to having that sounding board and those people giving us feedback a lot. So, um, so it's important to source that stuff out because when you go in a business, especially when you start on your own, as you, as you're aware, I mean, I know you have a co-founder, but you know, when you don't have that immediate feedback, at times as well, it can be a bit discouraging, um, but it's important that you recognize that to go, okay, well, I've got to give myself feedback or go and source it out, which is why it's important to, to lean on the people around you. So yeah. I think, you know, we don't give ourselves as much credit as what we probably should do as athletes to, to realize that the experience that we actually generate through traveling, performing, and the way we go about living our life, um, is highly, highly valuable in the real world outside of our sports. And, and I, and I feel there's a massive shift now with organizations actually looking for those skills. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you take where I work now in terms of the uh, flow science, what's involved with that, you know, like to get more of that autonomy, that flow in your life, that those peak moments of performance, like we do when we're competing, um, they're valuable, valuable experiences to have in the workplace. You know, studies show that there's a 500% increase in productivity when you're in flow. You know, um, your learning is um, accelerated by 400 odd percent. Um, creativity goes up. And, and there's all these things that are really highly valuable in a corporate environment or any environment to, for that matter that we have just naturally built from being high performance and those things are now what organizations are and should be looking for in their, um, in their employees. So there's so much that we have, um, but we can't, sometimes we need people to point that out and just point us in the right direction, connect those dots for us to go, oh man, holy, you know, really I've got, I've got a lot of tools here that it can add a lot of value to an organization or, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, business, whatever it is that you become intrinsically motivated by again. So, so I think there's a lot to be said to that. Just going back to where you started, you know, go back, having the courage to go back to the start and go, I'm back at the beginner's mind again. I'm back practicing, you know, my backhand drop shot over and over and over again to fine tune it, to master it and master it. You know, that's, 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 you, you've been there and done it. You've got to draw on that and use it as a, uh, a real confidence boost to go, I've done this before. I've been a beginner before and I beat and I mastered something. There's no reason why I can't do that again. In fact, I've got so much experience in doing it. I'll probably do it quicker this time. Okay. So, so yeah, it's a long answer, but, uh, but yeah, I think athletes have a lot more to give than, than what we often recognize in ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, on how you you sort of put it, especially that point on, as as squash players, you know, you you've essentially been been doing business the whole time from the admin side of things to putting in the work to actually seeing the success. So going through the 
those stages. And I, I hadn't actually thought of it like that. So that's really, really interesting. And for everyone mm -hmm. listening and watching wherever you're listening or watching, be sure to check out uh, the link uh, or check out the description and check out the link for the Inspired Peak Performance Flowcast. Be sure to go and tune in to what uh, Paul is doing and do check out his website as well. Um, you know, Paul, you, you talked about how you had a lot of support during your career from the Australian Institute of Sport, the Victorian Institute of Sport. Um, to, you know, you then obviously after that became the uh, national coach at Squash Australia. Uh, tell me a little bit about your time there. How long were you there? What was what were what were sort of some of the successes that you personally felt you uh, achieved? And then you know we can talk a little bit about challenges and so on after that. Yeah, um, I guess I was well I'm national coach for about uh, two years, mm -hmm. and we, you know my fam, my my wife and I decided to make the move up to the Gold Coast. Um, yeah, in twenty seventeen, twenty seventeen, yeah, um, this was just before the Commonwealth Games, um, and I was really really excited about the opportunity to to work with Squash Australia and and the and the high performance team, you know, the elite teams that you know players and and I see it as a really exciting time for squash in Australia because we're we're at a point where we have we had to transition. Um, because no longer were we at the point where we had an abundance of players coming through. Um, and that the players that were doing doing well, you know, you Cameron Pillies, you Ryan Cuskelly's Donna, Rachel, um, you know, all of them coming to, you know, quickly towards the end of their, their careers. Um, so like, like most organizations in sport or even in business in general, there's, there's gotta be a contingency plan and gotta be a, a way to, to look to the future and rebuild. And, and the question that was asked of me is where is our next world champion? And I always said that we haven't, we haven't got the, we haven't built the environment at this point in time for that world champion to show up yet. Um, so leaning a lot of the lessons I'd learned through um, studying coaches and, and, and leadership and things like that, you know, it, it came down to what is the culture of our sport in Australia like and what needs to change for it to, for us to answer that question. When will we have an, the next world champion uh, or will we? And my answer to that question was always, it's just the person's not here yet. And we need to create a system that the country can get behind, a shared value system, a shared uh, culture system that we can all get behind, support, and get excited about and move towards in the same direction. All the while still trying to honor our unique um, micro visions and, um, personalities, egos, um, and expectations and trying to manage all that. So I thought the role was really exciting. Um, my wife and I moved up to the Gold Coast and just as we did that, we found out that we we're about to have our first child, um, which was also exciting and added a whole different layer yeah. <laughs> to the, uh, yeah. to the move and, and the, and the role. Um, but you know, through the Commonwealth games, I mean, I think, we did really well um getting uh you know the two gold medals and um and a bronze um it was a challenging time because of the way that players are transitioning ages you know how do we bring the next group through was always had always had to be um at the forefront of our vision, in my opinion um because one of the things that was holding us back was lack of exposure to international competition. Our young players just were not getting um, exposure to the best competition in the world often enough. Um, 
so that was a big part of what I felt was necessary or was needed um, in the moment. So, so yeah, so I, the Commonwealth Games was, was fantastic. Um, I think we did really well with the team that we had. Um, um, and then World Doubles before that, we, we did really well also. And, and yeah, and, and during that time that I was national coach, you know, the junior world junior teams also had the best results in, you know, the first world junior I took the boys with Vicky Cardwell to Poland um, and the boys finished seventh, which was, I think the first time they'd finished in the top 10, the top eight in 16 odd years. Um, and then the girls in, in Malaysia on my last trip finished um, top 10 as well, which um, had been some time. So, um, and then my last event with the seniors was the World Doubles here in the Gold Coast. And albeit it wasn't a, um, a, a strong showing from, from the international representation, but, you know, it was, I think we won every medal bar one. So, um, so I think from a results standpoint, we did really well. Um, there was a lot of challenges within um, trying to implement a new strategy or a new vision um, that was met with a lot of uh, um, uncertainty and um, challenges uh, internally, organization-wise and externally. And um, Albeit there were many that supported that as well. So um, it was a job that I was highly passionate about, one that kept me up at night, one that I knew required tough decisions to for, for the sport to move forward, um, and one that ultimately was going to lead to some, some falling out and uh, some challenging times. But you know, I was prepared for that and, and knew it was coming. But, uh, but yeah, the opportunity to have an impact um, on the sport nationally was something I was really passionate about because playing for Australia was the ultimate for me, winning world championships back to back. Um, for the Australian men's team was probably the biggest highlight of my career. And, you know, the passion I have for wearing that green and gold in the Australian uniform is, is way, way up there. So, so yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's on, on the one hand, you've obviously, you you've been there and you you've won these the, the 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 athletes have won these medals and competed at these tournaments perform really well on the other side as you touched on you know from an organizational perspective it was really challenging uh like you said you're prepared didn't necessarily go the way that um you may have hoped i assume when you initially started um what what was going on there what you know when when i when i look at um squash australia today and i'm sure i'm sure to an extent you could relate from your playing days that it's it's a far cry from what uh squash in general in the country uh from what it was back back then you know i mean uh australian athletes have generally dominated the game for long periods over history uh, today we look at it and I, I believe on, on the women's side of the game, there's two or three players who are in the top 50, uh, maybe not even. And on the men's side, there's nobody. So that's quite, you know, striking that, that if that doesn't say that there is, uh, exactly what you sort of touched on that next set of people coming through. And I think, you know, we, we had, uh, Jenny Duncalf on the on the podcast a few months ago and she, you know, she would just keep saying she, I think she mentioned this a couple of times where she was like, look, it's the future isn't as bright at the moment. Maybe it's a few years down the line. Uh, I spoke to Jeff Hunt a while ago. He also sort of said, look, we sort of have to look at 10 years rather than three or four or five. So let me break that out down into two separate questions. One, Tell me a little bit about, you know, what was it from the organizational perspective that made it so difficult for you um, and eventually led to you sort of leaving? Um, and then the second half of it, I guess, which we'll come to later, 
is you know where is where is squash australia today uh what's what's gone wrong yeah there's a i mean yeah it's a, there's a lot to uh unpack around it all and yeah. for, for both questions mm -hmm. um from an organizational standpoint um there were there was a I felt like there was a there was a good vision of where the sport needed to go. Um, there were some really cool strategies um, that were talked about behind that. Um, when I first came on board, uh, I mean, you know, the team the team of people that were there and that the, the capabilities they had to execute a really awesome um, future for our sport was was exciting. I mean, we had some great, some great people in some really key roles that could really move the dial and had some phenomenal ideas. And, you know, I like to think that I was part of that as well in terms of having some ideas. Um, and that's the cool thing about ideas that, you know, you can try them and if they don't work, you, you, you try something else. And the unfortunate part about the organization, and this is why there were so many people that that came in, came in and, and left so quickly, um, a, a large number, was because those people with these great strengths and ideas and, and ability to potentially move the dial and take the vision and even build on it, were not allowed to. The, there was a severe amount of micromanaging there's a, a severe amount of um, fear built into the um, organization and a huge lack of autonomy and um, creativity. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I look at all this, the study that I do now and, and think about bringing um, flow science into an organization where shared purpose, um, passion, curiosity, um, you know, um, being challenged, like, and, and being put in a place to use your strengths, uh, all these things that are kind of flow triggers that will lead to people's uh, workplace satisfaction and, fe and feeling like they're con contributing to a bigger, something bigger than themselves, yeah. were just not present. The, and, and there was, there was a huge lack of um, integrity involved, a lot of things. Um, and people can't survive in those environments. People can't thrive and flourish. And when you've got some really talented people, they aren't going to stay around very long. They're going to move on, which is what we found within the organization. I mean, you don't have to look far from a few people and find out where they are now to know how well they're doing in what what they've moved on to and the positions they're in. Um, but outside of that, there was a lot of pressures from the states. The states were, you know, there's a lot of, of challenging, like the different people in different positions and the different um, personalities, egos, concepts, ideas, and things. It just wasn't gelling. That shared vision, that, that sense of purpose and um, clarity was, was really not there, uh, which, you know, a sport will not survive, an organization will not survive without that buy-in from the major stakeholders or employees. Um, it just won't happen. And, um, yeah, there's just a lot of, there's, there's a lot of things that were wrong about the way things operated. Um, and you know, and that's from my perspective, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I won't speak on behalf of anybody else, but um, this, this, the way this the organisation was being led was not allowing anyone to to thrive there, let alone the sport. And that was the whole reason we were all there was to help the sport flourish. Um, and become something new. And, and again, it wasn't going back about what 
let's get it back to where it was because it's never going to be back to where it was. We've got to forget that because you're putting yeah. pressure on young players to create something that they may not even want to be a part of. You know, if you, if you, if you speak to a lot of the young players today and find out what their actual goals and dreams are, that, you know, we don't have the world championship. You know, it's, it's, it's a different environment. Yeah. So, um, I mean, look, there's lots of things that I probably could have done a hell of a lot better as well. Um, nobody's perfect. Everyone deals with challenges and things differently. Um, but I think there was a lot of evidence that was ignored from the board that should have been looked at deeply and heavily um, that could have saved a lot of people from moving on and getting the, the true value out of what they actually brought to the table. Um, and there's probably lots of, lots of great people for the, these roles. Mm -hmm. um, but when you, when an organization hires somebody, especially in, in um, manage, management roles or high performance roles, there's got to be a level, level of trust, autonomy, um, and, and value that is given to those people to allow them to, to lean in on their strengths hard, support them deeply and allow them to, to learn and grow and, and if it fails, then support them and let, let's figure out what, how to fix the problem. Um, but from my perspective, we weren't uh, put in the position to, to even really you know, have a crack at something. Yeah. Um, and that's stifling. And that, to me, was um, definitely not the way I've lived my life in the past. And it eventually got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't function anymore personally. Like, um, you know, I didn't realize that I was, you know, I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with anxiety. Um, I, I didn't know who I, 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 you know, my confidence level had dropped a lot. Um, and I just wasn't showing up the way I know I can show up for the job, for the players, uh, and most importantly for my family. So yeah, no one should have to, to go through yeah. that. And, um, and again, there's probably lots of things I would do differently now, knowing what I know now mm -hmm. that, you know, but that experience led me to really start searching for this stuff and, and connect a lot of dots and also to go, you know what, in a way, I guess everybody did the best they could with what they had available to them. Um, but it's really important that we sometimes put our hands up and go, I don't have all the answers for this. Mm -hmm. um, and have that vulnerability and courage to go, this is what we're trying. Yeah. Yeah, we need to support this. And, and if, it mess, if we mess it up, well, then we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board and we'll try something new. So, um, so yeah, so I just had to leave the role that I really cherished and loved. Um, just you know, purely for myself, for my own well-being and, yeah. and health, because that was what was suffering more than I realized and more than what anyone else was probably realizing as well. And mm -hmm. uh, I just I had lost all respect for the majority of the leadership in the organization, which that's not going to that's not going to help anyone either. So um, yeah. rightly or wrongly. No, look, thank you. Thanks for obviously sharing yeah. that. It's, it's never, uh, you know, easy having to go through that for anybody. And, and, you know, we are obviously in, in a much better world today than we were, uh, in regards to things like mental health, well being, uh, even five years ago. So I want to slightly move that forward to that, uh, specific time in your life how do you how do you sort of you know recognize that yes i am going through this and then work on overcoming that because anybody uh you know things like anxiety depression uh other mental health issues are never easy for anybody to deal with there's always a significant challenge it impacts everyone differently um and you know you can go down 
a plethora of different paths. It doesn't, uh, you know, you're, you're obviously on this path now of entrepreneurship, but what was it like at that point and how did you sort of, uh, overcome it and move forward? And what was, if, like, if you could tell me a little bit about that process. Um, at the time, at the time I didn't realize what I was probably going through. Um, but I knew it was something that I hadn't really, um, experienced on that level before. Like if I think back to, um, to my, that time, there was just a big cloud. Like it just seems very cloudy. Like, um, you know, like I don't remember a lot about stuff like that and which, you know, again, yeah. going back to what I've learned now, like you know, depression will, will suffocate your memory. It'll affect you, your brain in a, in a really not a bad way. Um, but I did know that I was, I was struggling and I was fortunate that just before I, um, walked away, um, you know, the, the AIS have spent a lot of time, a lot of money, have invested a lot of money into athlete wellbeing, yeah. um, as they should be like, it's significant and we need to be, we need to be normalizing the struggles and the things that athletes go through and, and are exposed to. And there was a, there was a little bit of stuff around what's happening with coaches. And I was fortunate to be able to be supported by the AIS and get some, uh, some help to sort of unpack what had happened and, um, how to move forward. So there was a couple of months there where I, I'd seen, um, a psychologist to, to make sense of things and, um, and, and, and go through that point of reconnecting with myself, as I said earlier, yeah. um, and, and, and as you said, it's, it's really different for everybody and, and everybody's experience. And, you know, I was, you know, I consider myself fortunate at the time, you know, my daughter was um, just about to turn one yeah. and, you know, like it was really hard for me to, to not be at home and seeing her smiling and growing and learning to, to not sort of have something to really you know, want to be better for and, and, um, and, and, and just show her that, that there's resiliency in us and, and we can overcome things if we try and keep trying. Um, so with that support and from my family and the kind of, and I guess it's just that pig headedness in me as what as part of my athlete for going, no, I'm not going to mm. let this win. I'm not going to, mm. you know, like, I'll, I'll, I'll figure this out. I'll get through it. Um, and just sort of going back and connecting to things that used to really excite me, like my music and, and playing yeah. squash when I was younger, um, coaching those moments of, you know, like what you feel when, when the athletes are about to win a, win a big match or, there's the growth moments that they have the developments and the breakthroughs and things like all these things that it's going back to connect with those things and try to figure out where they, where they are in the future. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I really had a clear plan mm -hmm. in place. Um, and it's certainly a, um, something that, that can rear its ugly head pretty quickly if you don't stay on top of it. But I've kind of used that as fuel to sort of drive me forward going, I don't, people shouldn't have to feel that way at work mm. or in their environments, you know, and, and I think we as high performers, as leaders, as organizations, as, you know, even like you guys starting a business, you're getting interns coming in, like we have a responsibility to those um, people that we take under our wing to, yeah. to try and make sure that performance and moving the dial forward is, is taken care of, but yeah, making sure they're moving forward as people as well and growing and learning and 
and experiencing great moments in their life and have the ability to do great work, to have the ability to do things that they can connect with. Because if you've got passionate people turning up to work mm -hmm. um, and, and doing things they love doing, that environment is, is exponentially greater immediately. And if you've got people that are getting lit up at work and loving what they're doing, they're going home and having that ripple effect on their children and their family, their, their yeah. partners, their spouses, their parent, you know, the ripple effect of that is huge. And it's one thing I wish I I'd thought a bit more about. It was always in my mind when I was coaching, mm -hmm. you know, my philosophy was, you know, build great people first, build and then, then build great athletes. But I don't think I really harnessed how to do that extremely well. And I wish I had more time in the role to, to grow and learn into that, to really harness that. But I feel like whatever I experienced at Squash Australia has led me to this moment. Yeah. And I feel like the work I can do now it will be exponentially greater um, through that, through those learnings. So there's a big part of me that's grateful for everything that I experienced there. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff. Um, mm -hmm and bad moments and sleepless nights and things like that. And there were also some really great moments. And I guess that's what it's all about is taking those things and, and just moving forward and, and, and try to just keep getting better yeah. day in, day out. And, and bit by bit, as I, as I continue to sort of do things, keep moving forward, try new things, do, do new courses, learn, um, and reconnect with my strengths. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of, slowly found myself out of it. But what I realized is that, you know, the, the quickest way out of it all was one was my family, but second of all was just doing stuff that I freaking love doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But forcing myself to do it at first. Like, yeah. I, you know, I remember saying to my wife, I don't know who I am anymore. And so I just had to go and do things. And as I did things and, and met new people and had different conversations and just kept moving forward, leaning into that struggle, leaning into the whole thing. It really, I started to connect with those things that lit me up again. Mm -hmm. and, and as I started doing those, but the, I mean, the neurobiology behind flow and experiencing things that, that excite you is so powerful. It lasts for days. Like the neurochemistry involves dopamine and the, yeah. um, everything you get from the, from those wrapped moments is powerful. And, you know, not to, to diminish anyone's experience with mental health, but there's a lot to be said with the power of, you know, finding your zone in the zone moments and, and mm -hmm. doing those things. Because what we do know about flow is that the more flow you get, the more flow you get. So I just really started to do that. I started just immersing myself in stuff that excited the hell out of me. And then, and that's, and that sort of led me here now. So yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And you know, you are in this place now, or at this point now, where you know, when if someone tunes into your flowcast, you can see the passion, how much you enjoy it, your dedication to what you're doing. Uh, so you have, you know, obviously taken on some of those things that you had to deal with, and really come out of it to create what you're doing now and at the same time enjoying it. And I guess that's where I, Paul, would like to sort of wrap things up and ask you, what do you have coming up on that front of uh, inspired peak performance in the near future? What's going on? How do people uh, who are interested get in touch and so on? Yeah, yeah, thanks. You know, and thank you so much for the opportunity to, to chat with you and and, and be on the uh, on the webcast. It's it's a, it's a it's a privilege. But just to add to that, Lou, I think it's also important for me to say that you know throughout that whole journey, it was important for me to also take a good look at myself and and sort of acknowledge where I, you know and take some responsibility for for things that you know that that take place. You know, we're not all um, innocent in in every capacity. You know. With, certain decisions lead to decisions and certain actions lead to actions and, and so on. So I think it's also important. And that's a big part of my programs is that you know, we've got to look at that shadow self a little bit mm -hmm. to understand where, where the darker side of us comes from. And, and I've 
again, that's probably the biggest thing I would sort of say, if I could tell my 18 year old self what to look for and what to unpack right now would be learn about your ego, understand why it's there, understand what triggers it and, and put some really focused attention on how to combat it and, and befriend it because if you can befriend that ego, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, yeah. But inspired people things. So right now I'm getting ready to launch um, a game changer program, which is mm -hmm. it's a it's a, it's basically built it around the inspired peak performance uh, name. So the first stage is inspired. It's all about creating your philosophy and vision. Um, visualization was a huge part of my um, mental training as an athlete. Um, so there's a lot around that. Um, it, it links heavily to sort of. Um, humanistic psychology as well through um, uh, Abraham Maslow's work and Scott Barry Kaufman more recently around the hierarchy of needs and making sure that we're integrating those things into our life. Um, that's really powerful. Stack with some positive psychology uh, fundamentals that kind of lead us to, to access flow more often. Um, and so there's a sec second stage about the peak stage is about integrating all that effectively and efficiently into your lifestyle and then the third stage is about performance so it is a it's a 12-month program um i had been working on some eight-week and four-week programs but what i recognized was that change in your journey takes time you know yeah. so i'm building something that can support um people through a long-term journey and that's that targeted more towards your high performance coaches and leaders executives and entrepreneurs and, and organizations and then also working towards an athlete uh, flow for athletes program, which will be kind of a more of a short, it might be about a 12 to 16 week journey, um, learning about how to get flow, how to focus and the mindset behind it. And, um, and also all underpinning that is the well-being factor to make sure that we've got some really significant measures in place to make sure that we as people are, are okay first and foremost, and how to shift that a little bit shift the peak performance thinking from let's just keep grinding it out so let's you know work it out and, and do this mindfully and, and intelligently um and also i work one-on-one -on -one with clients as well so athletes executives um, entrepreneurs um, and organizations so you can reach me through the uh, inspiredpeakperformance.com website um and yeah on instagram i'm at inspired peak performance and yeah, if you, you know, I've got, uh, you know, anyone can book in for a free performance and flow chat right now, where we just talk about, you know, what, what shows up in their life and how to potentially get more flow into their life a brief conversation, what would entail working together, um, to see if we're a good fit and yeah, I'm used by people performance flow cast. Um, we've got some, uh, I've had some really interesting chats around performance, peak performance and, and that well-being and, and different things. So. That can be found on Apple and Spotify and and on my website also. So yeah, yeah so I appreciate the, uh, yeah. the opportunity. No, look, it's it's obviously it's been a pleasure having you on on the show, Paul, and getting to hear your insights on a wide array of things. For everyone listening, watching, however you are accessing this, be sure to check out the description. All the details uh, that Paul's just mentioned will be there. You know, if you think this is something that you'd like to get involved in, uh, get in touch with him and, you know, go from there. You've obviously heard the whole conversation and gotten a bit of insight on what it's about from the man himself. Paul, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Yeah, it's been a pleasure and uh, yeah, all the best. I love what you guys are doing and uh, keep up the awesome work. Thanks.